Good evening. I am Doug Koshik, director of the Baldwin Public Library. I would like to welcome everybody here on this blustery evening to hear a lecture on the gales of November. Uh, this is part of a series sponsored by the Baldwin Public Library and the Friends of the Birmingham Historical Museum and Park. We offer many programs at the library, some sponsored by the museum, many more that are not. Uh, recently, you should have received in the mail the winter newsletter for the library called Books and Beyond, and all of our programs uh, from December through February are listed there. In case you haven't, we have copies at the back of the room for you to take with you. Our speaker this evening is Joel Stone. Joel is the senior curator for the Detroit Historical Society, which oversees the De Detroit Historical Museum, the Dawson Great Lakes Museum, and a quarter of a million artifacts in the city of Detroit's collection. Raised in the Detroit area, he has studied journalism, history, archaeology, and archival management at the University of Detroit, Wayne State University, and the University College, Cork, Ireland. He supports a number of regional history organizations and is a member of the Association for Great Lakes Maritime History. Welcome, Mr. Stone. Thank you, Doug. Well, good evening, and what a night to talk about the gales of November, huh? It, it, it certainly is one of those nights to uh, make us think, yeah, okay, winter's coming. And indeed, truly it is. Um, the gales of November, in fact, we were just talking about pictures like this. Um, the weather on the, on the lakes, how many people here sail or have sailed? Commercially, pleasure, okay. Um, I, I'm a sailor, have been since I was 10. Um, I've done power boats, I've done uh, mostly rag boats. Um, I really like boats when they're on the surface, okay? I'm not. Gales in November result in shipwrecks, and I think that that tends to have the profile and the appeal for a, for a program like this, and we will be talking about shipwrecks. Um, shipwrecks are the result, usually, of a combination of things, and, and we'll discuss some of those. Um, we're going to look at some of the boats that have become shipwrecks on the Great Lakes. Um, we're also going to look at what happens to shipwrecks after they happen, um, how they become part of our lore, how they become wonderful tools for historians, archaeologists, anthropologists, um, sports divers, how they become things that we can enjoy after that, and, and there's a, in, indeed a rich history of that. Um, just to kind of click through here, Gales of November, it's not a myth. It's, you know, it's fact. Um, this was pr published by, I believe, by the Detroit Free Press. But you can see that, that bar graph on the very top there. Um, you know, as you march through the year, of course, the first few months, there's nothing. That's because there's nobody out there. Okay? As shipping grows, there you get more and more shipwrecks. In fact, we had an a evening the other night at the Dawson called the Lost Mariner's Remembrance on the anniversary of the loss of the Edmund Fitzgerald. This year we commemorated a boat that was lost 100 years ago on Lake Superior, very similar to the Fitzgerald, but it was lost in April. So it's possible for storms to come up and take boats out early in the year. However, if you look at that graph, October is ugly, November is worse. Okay, this, There are things about this time of year that conspire to create weather that's really tough for sailors. Um, if we look at a map of the, you know, North America and how the Great Lakes fits in there, um, it's a vast area. I mean, the Great Lakes themselves are a lot of water over a lot of space, but they've got a lot of things going on weather-wise, and I'm not a meteorologist, I'm not going to pretend to be, but when you've got this time of year, and today we're suffering those, those cold winds coming out of Canada, um, Secretary at Work was saying, you know, two words for today's weather, blame Canada. <laughs> and unfortunately we can. I mean, it's an Alberta Clipper type thing that's coming down out of Canada. But if you get this kind of weather, and it's very changing at this time of year, late September, 
October, November. Um, we've also got some real dry wind coming in off of the southern prairies. And then you get really, really wet winds and, and weather coming north out of the south. Um, the storm of 1913, 101 years ago last year, the storm that took out more boats than any other, the, the, the cell that really caused that storm had traveled across the Great Lakes days before, ended up down near South Carolina and turned around and came back and hit the lakes. So we're dealing with mixes. I mean, it ran into a front like today's coming out of the North Country, and that's what really created the storm of 1913. So we're talking about a vast area dealing with that. Um, you know, the Great Lakes, an incredible resource, and I don't think anybody, even those people that, that truly make their living appreciating it, I don't think we appreciate what we've got here as far as um, not only a, a freshwater resource, a recreational resource, but how it developed, how it was instrumental in developing the, the Old Northwest, in developing, you know, the, the Ontario region and the upper states. Um, you know, it's, it's so vast that down to the south in Ohio, you're dealing with a, a climate that's much more like northern Tennessee or Kentucky. You get over the west and we've hit the plains. We've got, we get into the, the grasslands that extend out for um, hundreds of miles. And to the north, you've got subarctic boreal forests. We, my wife and I went around the top of Lake Superior two years ago. And you get up there and you are, you're, in, you're almost frontier again. I mean, it's, I had, it's been a long time since when I would leave a town, I would look at my gas tank to make sure that I had enough gas to get five or six or eight towns down because you never knew what you were going to encounter. So it really is a, a wonderfully vast area, six quadrillion gallons of fresh water, 20% uh, of the world's fresh water, um, and 85% of what we've got here in North America. But an incredible surface area and a massive watershed. It's a wonderful resource, and tied up in that is a Great Lakes Maritime that's all of its own. Um, Great Lakes waves, those who have been on sailors, you understand. Great Lakes waves are not like ocean waves. Um, on the ocean, waves travel a long distance. You can have a 30-foot wave that you kind of ride softly up and you ride softly down. A 30-foot wave is not scary on the ocean. Um, waves are generated by wind. Waves are generated by proximity of the bottom. So on the ocean, bottom's a long way down. Um, on the Great Lakes, the bottom is close. Not so, not so close and superior, but Lake Erie, the average depth is, you know, 18 to 20 feet. There are places that go down to 60 and 80, I think even 100 on Lake Erie, but that'll really turn up a wave, and a 30-foot wave on the Great Lakes is a scary thing. The wave action is much shorter and quicker. You don't have that long ride up and down, so the wave action is tough. Um, it's something they had to take into account building the boats. It's something mariners have to take into account dealing with the waves. Shore proximity. On the ocean, if you get into a storm, you just turn tail and run. And chances are you can run for a couple of days until the storm blows itself out. On the Great Lakes, if you get caught in a storm and you turn tail and run, depending on where the wind's coming, you're going to hit something in a couple of hours. Um, you know, at Lake Michigan side to side, 50 miles wide, you turn tail and run in a storm, you're going to hit bottom in two hours. Um, you got a little more time running north and south. Uh, shallow harbors have always been a problem for mariners on the Great Lakes, getting in and out. So you may be able, be able to get to the harbor, but because of the way the waves are hitting the bottom and rolling up the rollers, you may end up sideways before you get to the break wall. So it's, it's a tough nature. Um, there's money. I can go into the whole thing about the Congress allocating money. There's money to dredge. It isn't being used. Our ships are running light. Shallow harbors are a problem. Um, rivers, lots of rivers, which require navigational skills. Completely different from the ocean. The ocean, as long as you can get yourself out of New York Harbor on the way to Singapore, you're not going to hit anything for a couple of weeks. Okay? On the Great Lakes, you'll leave Superior, and by the end of the day, you're navigating the St. The Mary's River. Okay? And soon after that, you're navigating the Straits of Mackinac, the Calumet, um, the Cuyahoga, the Detroit River. There's a lot of places that require navigators to pay attention and be on all the time. Um, frequent stops, that's actually a good thing, but from a navigational standpoint, 
if I can get a boat out of the well and I can get a boat back into the well, those are the two hardest parts of my sailing experience. Once I'm out on the lake, I'm not going to hit anything. These guys who are running the boats, if they've got to stop every day, every two days, it requires a lot more skill than sailors who sail the open waters. And primary cargoes is something, I mean, it, containerization has changed things a lot, but the ocean you carry anything. Here we basically carry stone, coal, um, steel, uh, taconite these days, you know, limestone, sand. There's a few cargoes that we carry in bulk and we've made our ships to carry those. Um, we also have a unique maritime here on the Great Lakes. Uh, it's a relatively stable workforce. Uh, on the ocean, sailors, I mean, sailors have gotten kind of a reputation and, and probably deserved, but on the ocean, you know, you hop from ship to ship. You may not work for the same company very long. The voyages are long. You know, they, they can often take weeks. Um, you may be with a ship for a month or two. On the Great Lakes, though, the guys that I know who have been sailing the lakes, you know, have been with the same company most of their lives. Early on, the days of the schooners, your uncle probably owned the schooner. His sons worked for him, and if you're lucky, you got a job working there. His wife was the cook. It was a very close family and always has been on the Great Lakes. Um, so the, the, stabilized, the stable workforce is an important thing. Government regulations have always worked, well, not always, but over the last hundred years, have worked in favor of mariners. They've, they've made the boats more safe. They've made the boats more comfortable. Um, not necessarily on a Panamanian flag ship, a Liberian flag ship, you're not going to have the same, same thing. They may be running with a crew of 12. Ship on the Great Lakes seldom runs with a crew of less than 25. Um, amenities and perks. I mentioned the frequent stops. That's always a good thing because every time you stop, you can get fresh food. Guys on the lakes have uh, great vegetables. In fact, guys on the lakes eat better than sailors any place in the world. Um, you can also get on and off. If there's a death in the family, you've got to go to a christening. You can get time off. You can get off the boat, go and come back and have your job. And nomenclature adapted specifically for the lakes. The guys that steer the boats are wheelsmen. Instead of helmsmen or steersmen, they're wheelsmen. Um, the Great Lakes guys work in miles per hour as opposed to knots per hour, which is used every place else. Um, if you're standing in a pilot house, go down to the pilot house at the Dawson Museum and you'll look up and you're going to see two signs that say right and left, okay? Working in very simple terms, a lot of times the guys who came on board were not necessarily trained mariners. They might have been working in the lumber camps during the winter and they work on the boats during the summer. Right and left works great. They use starboard and port. They know what they mean, but in an emergency, right is right and left is left. So unique, and, and that's by law. You got to have those signs by law. Uh, quick timeline: If we're talking wrecks, let's real quickly run through what kind of wrecks we had. Of course, the first boats were canoes. We then went into sailing ships, and then steamships, and and today diesel driven. Um, you know, these boats have been around forever, and these boats have been wrecked. One of these was found in Cass Lake, 20, 30 years ago. You know, perfectly preserved. Um, the guy probably didn't hit something. It probably got old and he sank it. But there are wrecks of boats like this. Of course, the birch bark canoes, they bust it all the time. But the best part about a birch bark canoe is you pull over to the side, you get some birch bark, you get some sap, you get some uh, um, spruce root, and you can fix the thing right there. So birch bark wrecks, not so many. Um, of course, every tribe had their own design, and they used them for different things. But they were, they were wonderful, probably the best designed boat in the world, I would argue. They could be shelter, they could get you anywhere, and you could repair them at the side of the river. And they were great for tourists, too. The woman who painted the last two pictures is sitting kind of right in the middle of that boat with a top hat on. Uh, York boats to the north, uh, lots of these on the bottom, lots of these can be found because many of them were just pulled up on the beach and scrapped. Uh, but it's really when we get into the passenger vessels that we talk about real wrecks. This is a drawing that uh, Hennepin did. Father Hennepin was traveling with LaSalle when they were building the Griffin, the first built, built on the Great Lakes. And arguably, when it comes to wrecks, it's the Holy Grail. Um, this is probably what it looked like. We don't have a real good idea. I mean, Hennepin gives us the, the tall after castle that was pretty typical, the real round type vessel that was built by Europeans. So that's probably what it looks like. 
And again, as the Holy Grail, it sailed from Buffalo up to, or Black Rock, up to Green Bay. LaSalle had sent an advance party. There was a bunch of furs waiting for him. He loaded them into the boat. They were going back to Montreal. He was going to be a rich man. And they never saw the boat again. It left Green Bay, left Washington Island, sailed off, and nobody knows where it went, although recently they've been finding it. Um, about every 20 years they find it. And 1950s, there was some great archaeology done, a lot of in-depth research over by Tober Mori by the Flower Pot Islands. Nah, it didn't turn out to be it. They found it up in the Manitoulins in uh, uh, the 70s. Great research, a lot of writing. It wasn't it. Um, 1990s, I heard a guy give a great talk about how he had found it up in the Chinos. You know, and they, they get pretty deep into the stuff, you know, how the, how the, uh, the framing re meets the keel and how the, the knees are put in and that kind of stuff, trying to tie it back to French vessels. Um, the archaeologists came over and said no. And most recently, of course, they found it up in Lake Michigan, which is probably where it is. The guy who found it, though, um, all he found really was a log sticking out of the bottom of the lake, and he hung a lot of, lot of money, a lot of time, a um, lot of legal research. Uh, the problem is the things on the bottom land now belong to the state of Michigan. As soon as he found it, the state said, thanks for finding it. We'll take it from here. He didn't want to give up this thing he had been searching for for so long, so he went to France and said, I think I found one of your ships. And there's a precedent for this. Um, the French found one of our Civil War blockade runners several decades ago. It went to Admiralty Court because the Americans said, I think that's our ship, and the Americans won. Um, LaSalle, after he got done with the Griffin, went down the Mississippi, built another boat uh, called the LaBelle. And about 20-some years ago, that was discovered down near Galveston, in which case the French said, I think that's our ship. And it went to Admiralty Court, and the Admiralty Court said, you're right, that's your ship. Um, so when they found this one, this guy took it to the French and said, I think I found another one of your ships. Took several years to go through court. Indeed, the French have possession of whatever is down there, if it's indeed a ship. They had some archaeologists over last year. They did some searching. They did some uh, dendrochronology on the, the piece of wood. Dendrochronology was good, but everything else they found had nothing to do with a vessel. Um, the guy hasn't given up. He's going to go down with some magnetic imaging and, and see if he can find what's beneath the silt. And uh, it'll be interesting to see. If you see it in the paper, they report on it occasionally. Uh, find out if uh, this guy actually did find the griffin or if it's yet to be found in another 10 years. Um, so that really was, that was, that was the first. The first ship on the lakes, the first shipwreck. Um, other vessels, large and small, we had paddle wheel steamers down to the little bateaus that the French used to use. Um, earlier on, a lot of our ships were English or French based so that they looked like the ships that they were sailing on the Atlantic over time. Well, and this would have been kind of the last gasp at these kind of vessels. And several of these were wrecked, of course, in the Battle of Lake Erie. Um, but after this, we really turned our attention more to a, a Great Lakes design vessel, a vessel designed for the, the shorter waves, designed for the shallower harbors, designed to be navigated up and down the rivers a lot. Um, the schooners were probably absolutely the most common in any given year in the 1830s, or, uh, I'm sorry, the 1880s, 1890s, there would be anywhere between two and 3,000 of these things sailing the lakes. Classic boats, two or three masted usually, that triangular sail at the top is known as a rafi, uh, unique to the Great Lakes. These were really the workhorses of the lakes. Lots of these shipwrecks, if you're looking for them, they're down there. Um, we had our palace steamers, boats that carried passengers, large and small. Um, these were probably the greatest, but the Lady Elgin, of course, was one of those vessels involved in a horrible collision, involved in a, a huge loss of life, and available for, well, available for divers to look at, but not to touch. Um, out of Detroit here, of course, we knew the very large vessels. And fortunately for us, very few of the very large passenger carriers had any serious accidents, usually collisions. And collisions were common um, between schooners and schooners, between schooners and steamships. 
Um, collisions were a big cause of shipwrecks on the lakes. Of course, the inside of these boats was tremendous. Um, there were car farriers that carried uh, railroad cars back and forth on Lake Erie and on Lake Michigan. Um, Marquette and Bessemer II's uh, Lake Erie boat we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, the Edmund Fitzgerald represents straight deckers, um, a vessel with equally, you know, the hatches all at an equal distance, easy to unload, um, very, very common, hundreds of these any given year during the early uh, 1900s. The biggest change in that whole thing was straight deckers became self unloaders so that they didn't need help unloading. They could unload themselves. Carl Bradley will visit in a minute. Today, the boats are big, 1,000 feet long, 1,013 is the largest. There is about uh, 12 of these vessels running. Um, any one of these vessels replaces five Edmund Fitzgerald. When the Fitz came out, they replaced five of what they call the canal size boats. Um, over time, there have been less and less boats because the boats are just larger, they can handle more. Edmund Fitzgerald had a crew of 29. This boat would have a crew of 29. If you can carry five times as much than the Fitzgerald, this is a far more efficient vessel. Um, the newest thing on the lakes are articulated tugs, and happily there have been no accidents with these boats. Um, articulated tug essentially has a tugboat tucked in the back of a, of a freighter hull or a barge. Um, and these boats can run with a crew of 15 as opposed to 25, so they're even more efficient. This is kind of the, the latest development in the lake boats. So back to the storms of November. There's no question that November, this part of November, is a tough time to be sailing. Uh, these are the major storms that have happened over the last two centuries. And Arguably, some of them are small losses. Um, you know, eight beached boats means the boats were probably recoverable. Nine hands lost. Not so bad, but it was a, it was a big storm for 1835. 1905 was another big one. 1913, of course, was the huge storm that came through. We did the anniversary last year. Um, many boats lost, 13 boats, but many, many more put up on the rocks. Um, a lot of them salvaged. Um, and the biggest loss of life, 244 people were lost in the one storm. Black Friday in 1916 was bad, and probably the next big one was the Armistice Day storm, 1940. But if you look at the dates there, Black Friday, end of October, but uh, most of the rest of them right around that, Oct that November 10th date that we lost the Fitzgerald. Uh, storm in 1905, a little later than that, and some of the more remarkable wrecks um, later than that. We had a question earlier, how many shipwrecks are there? And the answer would be it depends on what you call a shipwreck. Um, I always go with a number over 3,000. Over 3, That's a pretty safe number. Dave Swayze has a wonderful resource online that you can go to. Uh, divers use it a lot to look up shipwrecks um, and he puts it up at 4,700. A lot of people say well over 5,000. Some people say over 6,000. Um, and again, it depends on what you call a shipwreck. Uh, I use the Metapha as my example of how to define it. Um, this went up in 1905. It was, again, it was coming into Duluth. They had left Duluth. The skipper, back in the old days, you know, iron men, iron ships, you went into a storm. You had to deliver that cargo. So they left the harbor, they got about an hour outside and said, holy Pete, and turned around and headed back for Duluth. And they were heading right in, they had lined up the, the if you're familiar with Duluth Harbor, it's got two uh, uh, piers coming out, had them all lined up, stern got picked up by a wave, turned the boat sideways, slammed it into the one of the piers, and it just kind of floated off to the side and rested, it was broken. And it settled there, Nobody could get to it. Nine of the guys who were, I believe, in the back end of the boat died. Um, front guy, the guys in the front got saved, guys in the back did not. Um, the boat was broken, men died on it, and yet they raised it, put it back together, put it back into service, and it worked for another 40 years. Um, is that a shipwreck? Does that count? Okay, so if we're talking numbers, they get skewed in different directions depending on what you find um, to be a shipwreck. 
A uh, vessel goes down, all of the equipment, all of the cargo gets salvaged. It goes in as a shipwreck, but by different definitions. So a um, couple of these are interesting. The very first one uh, that we had on the Upper Lakes, I mean, the Walk in the Water was the first steamship on the Upper Lakes, launched at Black Rock in, in 1818, and three years later, it's up on the beach. Uh, this was kind of a neat painting. I include it because um, Mrs. McMillan, who was on the boat, commissioned this picture to be painted, and there are two pictures of this shipwreck, um, one from the deck and then one from the shore. Uh, nobody died. It was remarkable. It got pushed up within feet of the Buffalo Lighthouse. The guys couldn't see the lighthouse for the storm until they were actually on the beach. Everybody got ashore. Everybody survived. All the equipment got uh, removed and put in the Superior, which is the, another steamship that came along after that but we still count it as a shipwreck. Um, I mentioned this boat, the Marquette and Bessemer II, uh, previously. This is a, car, an or, or a railroad car ferry that ran between Conneaut, Ohio, and Port Clinton, I believe, on Lake Erie. Okay, this went down on December 7th, so this was running late, kind of caught a late one. Um, they have never found this shipwreck. Okay, it's in Lake Erie. Remember I said Lake Erie is only like 18 or 20 feet deep? They've never found this wreck. It's one of those holy grails for shipwreck finders. Um, remember, I, I mentioned the Bradley. The Bradley was lost on Lake Michigan in 58, broken half uh, to the point where the back half, the propeller was still turning, driving the front half into the water. Um, two guys did get off. Well, actually, four guys got off. Two of them survived, um, were taken to Charlevoix, and, uh, and they were the only ones. Um, the Morel did the same thing on Lake Huron, broken half in a storm. Nobody's quite sure why. One of her sister ships, they studied the midsections afterwards, and they showed signs of cracks and wear. I mean, these are long boats, and Detroit, the, the, the Great Lakes vessels are made long because the waves are short. The idea being that if a long vessel, if you got a long vessel, it'll be supported by six or eight or ten waves at the same time. Um, shorter vessels, especially some of the ocean vessels, have a real hard time with our waves just because they are so short, they pitch a lot more. But because they're long and thin, they do tend to, they do tend to work in the waves, and in the case of the Morel, in the case of the Bradley, they broke in half. Um, we're not sure what happened to the Fitzgerald. Um, some have argued that it too broke in half. Some have argued that it hit bottom and carved a hole out of its side and just started taking on water and <laughs> If you're loaded with ore and you lose your, your flotation, you're going down. And um, there have been many theories about why the Fitzgerald went down, um, and I'm not going to go into those today. There are guys that do entire presentations on that. Um, one of them, I heard uh, the architect of the ship, uh, the Fitz was originally built to carry coal, to burn coal, and it was switched over to burn oil, and all the coal carriers right in front of the smokestack down right on the deck there is a is a bin that would hold the coal and the coal would automatically feed down to the to the furnaces um, when they switched to oil they just sheathed that over with a sheet of steel and the sheet of steel was only about a quarter inch thick and it wasn't supported and this architect's idea was that if you had a wave that came over your side and we saw that we saw that picture of the wave crowning the boat I've talked to lots of mariners who have been out on the lakes and have had that happen. They'll be up steering in the front of the boat and they'll turn around and look back and the only thing they see is the smokestack. Um, feasibly, logically, if a big enough wave hit that quarter inch sheet of steel, it could have caved it in. Um, there were broken vents, which are things that allow the, um, the crew to test the bilges. If there were broken vents, water's going down to the bilge. Um, it's likely they might have hit the shoal and opened the bottom. Um, in any given wreck, I'd argue that there's, there's ten explanations for what happened, and pick, pick your favorite three. It's probably not one thing that put the Fitzgerald on the bottom. It was likely more three or four things that did it. Um, this story has been told many times. Of course, Gordon Lightfoot made the, the wreck famous. Um, I used to have the song in here, but I, I don't have a love for that song. Uh, it, it, it made the Great Lakes famous, 
it's based on an old English broadside, so Gordon didn't really write the tune. It's only four bars long. It's like a four bars blues. And that's all you got from end to end. So song-wise, I'm not a fan of it. And if you got, if you've ever tried to sing it, download the poetry, try to sing the song. Poetry is rather clumsy. Now that I've had my say, I gotta say, it made Gordon Lightfoot famous, it made him a lot of money, and it put this wreck on the map worldwide. People know that song. It got into people's heads, it got into their hearts, and they love it. And thankfully, it's the last of the big shipwrecks. We haven't had a wreck since that time. Um, we did lose two sailors off the Westcott, probably about 10 years ago now. Um, but since then, we've not lost a big boat. And we were talking about this earlier. Would it happen again? Uh, arguably not. Uh, the Fitz was still a new boat. It was still in great shape. Um, the technology was pretty slim. Uh, she had two radars. Both of them were out. Uh, that probably wouldn't happen today. And with GPS, we have a lot better idea of where we are, even if you do lose your radars. Um, Satellite weather, that kind of thing that they can download to the ships is so much better than the weather faxes that the guys were getting when they left Duluth. Um, this is kind of the track of what the Fitz did with the, uh, the Arthur Anderson, either slightly ahead or slightly de de behind, depending on the trip. Um, and it just got over to a point off of Whitefish Bay and it just disappeared. It went down in a second, it's on the bottom, it's in two pieces. Did it break like the Bradley, like the Morel? Hard to say, if you put a 700-foot boat down on a 500-foot bottom, it's going to hit bottom with 200 feet of the boat still sticking out of the water. That would likely make a boat break in half. Um, again, many explanations for why it's down there. The winds that day, if you ever get a chance to, to read some of the stories about what the winds were doing at various parts of the lake, you talk about cyclonic. Um, you know, they were blowing out of the northeast uh, to the north, they were blowing out of the, the southwest to the south. Uh, wind speeds varied from 19 knots to 54 knots steady with gusts up to 65 and 70. Um, it all depended on where you were, what kind of weather the Fitzgerald was going through. It probably wasn't the same perfect storm that the storm of 1913 was, but they certainly were in the wrong place at the wrong time. Um, Anderson survived. Ten miles behind, probably pretty much the same weather. The Anderson survived. The William Clay Ford went out into that same storm, um, and they survived. So again, the Fitz probably had some mortal wounds in one form or another, whether it was uh, you know the thin sheet metal over their coal bunker or a hole in the bottom. They had problems, um, you know, and arguably the most famous wreck we've got, even though we've got well over 3,000 of them. So, we got shipwrecks. Great Lakes have wonderful wrecks. They're mostly well preserved by the fresh water. Cold water is the, cold fresh water is the best thing you can put anything into to preserve them. So the wrecks on the bottom of the Great Lakes are beautifully preserved. And some of them are pretty easy to find. You're walking down the beach over at Ogden Dunes in Indiana, you can walk right up to a shipwreck. This is a schooner probably pre-Civil War era. Uh, they've not identified her, but you know it's, it's there, easy to see, easy to walk up to and touch. If you go up to Tobermory and do a little tub, you can take a rowboat over this and you're probably three or four feet above this boat. You can um, you know, darn near reach down and touch it. And for those of us who are not scuba divers but can put on a mask and breathe underwater, you, know, you can actually dive this boat. This is easy to see. You can, you know, pretty much figure out the technology, beautifully preserved schooner on the bottom where it should be. Um, divers often used to have to do a whole lot of research to find a wreck. Um, well, let's zoom in on this. Um, if I'm reading this historical newspaper article, I'm going to realize that the Jack and the Norman came together. Um, the Jack took the worst of it and ended up off the Menominee River, opposite Middle Island, in a, or I'm sorry, the Norman took the worst of it, in about 300 feet of water. So if I'm looking for a wreck, I got a depth meter, I can figure out where 300 feet is, I can figure out where, you know, 
the Menominee River opposite Middle Island is, and I can start looking there for this wreck. Not hard to find. Um, well, not hard to identify an area to search. Um, this is also, this is a uh, log book from a schooner in 1856. And they're talking about sailing across Lake Erie and um, on the bottom, she was headed about north-northwest uh, with her lower mast heads were about six and a half feet above the water. Her main top masts were, um, you know, down, fore top mast still with the, the balls on the same. If I follow this guy's track through his, his log book, I can probably figure out where this wreck would be on Lake Erie. It's the hard way, though. All you do is basically identify a search area. Um, much easier to just go to the charts and look for that little symbol that looks like kind of a football shape there with the, the lines on. That means wreck. So by golly, if I want to really do a wreck, that wrecks in very shallow water, and I could probably look at it and, and drive my boat right up to it. And indeed, if you go to Google Maps, which has made life really easy for us, you can actually look at that shallows and kind of see where those wrecks are um, without even leaving your home. In fact, this funny one, we got a call from some people who had found a wreck off of Gross Point Park. And, you know, we just got on Google Maps and started looking around right where they told us to be. And, you know, here's this 100-foot schooner sitting on the bottom about 300 feet off the shore in Gross Point Park. Um, finding these things has become incredibly easy or not. Okay, this is the CB Lockwood and it sank in Lake Erie. When it sank, the Coast Guard went out and put markers on it and did very careful triangulations so they knew right where it was. Um, over the winter, those things, the, the markers all blew away, so they went back out and they remarked it, retriangulated, came up with the same numbers so that they knew exactly uh, where it was on a chart. You should be able to find the, the CB Lockwood. Jim Paskert went out and tried to find it. And he went right to where that spot was. And all he could find was a little bit of debris. Um, little de one of the davit, um, the things that hold the lifeboats, one of the davit was sticking out of the water. But that was it. There was no boat. And it was the end of the season, so they had to pack it in. And they went back and spent the winter trying to figure out, you know, were the numbers wrong? Were they looking in the wrong place? And then somebody said, you know what? Let's take a magnetometer out there. Magnetometer is a thing that, that measures iron, you know, magnets. Um, and they went out there and went over the same spot, and sure as heck, C.B. Lockwood's there. It's just sunk completely down into Lake Erie. Um, the western end of Lake Erie, the bottom is so aqueous that it's very much like uh, quicksand. It will just suck things up. So C.B. Lockwood is there. You just can't see it. Very much probably what has happened to Marquette and Bessemer too. It probably has just sunk, and that's a big boat. That's a four-decker that has sunk out of sight in Lake Erie. So some, some shipwrecks, easy to find, some not so easy. So once we think we've identified an area and we want to go out and find it, they used to go out with boats like this and just drag a line behind until they snag something, and then they'd stop and go down and look at it. After World War II, of course, sonar was developed and we started getting these, what they call fish, a sonar fish that you'd tow behind a boat like this. So the front, the front one would be a camera. Most of the guys I know that do this use a camera up in front and then they tow the fish over the back. And when you tow a sonar like that, you get, you know, you got to go back and forth a lot to find exactly what you're looking for. They kind of call it uh, mowing the grass. But when you get out there, this is what you'll get. You'll get a readout on your computer that clearly shows a wreck up on one side, a uh, possible wreck over on the other. You can also see some of the, de the bottom, what the bottom looks like. This is relatively old. This is probably 25-year-old technology. Today, the technology will actually come up clear enough that you can identify um, you know, the beams. You can identify hatches. You can identify how many um, uh, masts it had you can probably get a pretty good idea, a real good idea of the length. You can probably identify the boat before you even go down on it. But of course, that's not where the fun is. If you find a wreck, you gotta dive on it, right? That's what most of the guys do. In the old days, you had to do this. Pretty dangerous occupation. Um, you had to count on somebody up and above keeping you full of air. 
Um, and it was just, it was old technology. Now the new technology's changed. Person on the right is using kind of what I hope to use someday, simple scuba gear. One tank, a couple of regulators, a mask, and you know, basic, probably good to 50, 80, some good scuba folks to 120, 150 feet. Guy on this side is doing what they call tech diving or uh, tri-gas or um, he's basically mixing the gases based on how deep he goes. Your body goes through real big chemical changes. The farther you go down, the bigger the pressure. Your body goes through changes. You start mixing the gases differently. This used to be good to about 250 feet. I know I was just talking to a guy the other day who's been to 360 doing this, and I've heard that somebody was down to about 550 with this kind of technical diving. Um, they're pushing the envelope. They're going really far. Because usually, like the, the, the folks who went down on the Fitzgerald, they use something like this, 530 feet, and that's pretty hefty pressure. Um, this is kind of a you know completely articulated hard suit. This person's got you know air enclosed and has air coming down. They've got cameras and lights, all pretty self enclosed. Um, much safer way of doing it. Arguably much more expensive. In fact, if money's no object. Buy yourself a submarine. 30, 40 million bucks, you can go down and take beer with you. Um, you know, these guys can really relax when they go down and dive. Um, a much cheaper way of doing is something like this, a remotely operated vehicle. Um, ROVs, they call them. This is probably on the Titanic. Um, this is a great way of going. You can get down to incredible depths. You can get some wonderful data. Nobody gets in the water. Nobody's, nobody's in danger. Um, once you find it, you got to do something with it. You can either document it using photographs, um, scanning, various uh, techniques like that, or you can actually go down in relatively shallow water and do a transect, just like you would do an archaeological site on uh, terra firma. Um, if you bring anything up, you're not supposed to bring anything up. We'll talk about that in a minute. But if you do bring something up, and there are good reasons for that, it should go into a lab and get conserved. Um, we brought a cannon up out of the Detroit River three years ago. We just finished the conservation on it. It took three years to stabilize this big piece of iron. It's, this is, you know, you, you, and I don't understand chemistry. I had to call in some guys that knew what they were talking about. But this is up at uh, Alpena, and I don't know if you've ever been up to the, uh, the preserve up there. Alpena's got a wonderful NOAA preserve um, that they put in a beautiful museum and in the museum, they've got this lab right where you can see it. In fact, the windows there at the end look out onto the lobby. So you can actually walk up and see an underpaid intern, um, you know, working on, on the preservation that needs to be done if something comes up from a wreck. Very often, this stuff comes floating in on logs, beams that they, they then kind of try to preserve. Um, shipwrecks today are governed by some very stiff laws. I talked about it a little bit when we talked about the Griffin. But this is the reason right here, uh, the tale of two disasters, I call it. First disaster is that the brig Alvin Clark sunk. Uh, Alvin Clark was built in Detroit, down on Clark Street. Uh, Alvin Clark was the son of John Clark, who built the boat. Worked in the fishing industry for a while, then was sold to some lumber folks over in Chicago, and then later up in Green Bay. And it was actually returning from Chicago empty. It couldn't get a, a northern cargo, so it was going up empty. They figured, what the heck, open up the holds, let's dry this boat out. <laughs> nice summer day, um, except for that summer squall it blew through. Knocked them over, hatches were open, boat sunk in seconds, two of the five crewmen died, um, and the boat was lost. So that's the first tragedy. Um, about 100, in fact, 105 years later, that's my favorite part, the Alvin Clark's 105 feet long, it sank in 105 feet of water, and 105 years later, these guys found it. Actually, a fishing boat found it. Got their necks, nets stuck on the boat. Um, the guy in the middle, Frank Hoffman, was a local diver. Ran a bar. He dove. He had a couple things he did. Um, he went out to get the net and found on the bottom this perfectly preserved schooner. It had gone down, tipped over, but when it sank, it stood back up. So it was up. All the rigging was there. The masts were there. It was, it was just in wonderful shape. And he went out. <coughs> and raised a bunch of money and got divers from all over the Midwest to come out 
and got cables underneath it, hoisted it up. Um, luckily, Marinette Marine is right there, so they had all the big cranes and stuff they needed. I think here's a picture of that. They raised it up, and once they got it clear of the scuppers and threw in a couple of pumps and pumped it out, it floated like the day it went down. It was in perfect shape, absolutely perfect shape. Um, in fact, there's a, they, they took it into Marinette. They were going to make it into a museum. Um, this is what the bow looked like. And I, there was a picture a few slides ago of that guy doing the transect on the bottom, and he had one of these winches, you know, which is now on the other vessel completely covered with zebras. This boat looked as if you could put new hemp on it, put new sails on it, and go for a sail. Um, spectacular piece. In fact, Howard Chappelle, who was kind of the senior maritime historian in the United States at the time, said, this is more important than any of those treasure ships they were pulling up out in the Atlantic. He said, this actually shows us what a boat looked like and what people did to sail it, how they, you know, their day-to-day -day life, you know, there was, there was food, there was um, uh, crockery, the, the, we've, there's all kinds of wonderful things that we have off the boat, although we got lucky. Because soon afterwards, things went bad. Back then, there wasn't money. We did, there was no, um, you know, Center for Historic Preservation. There were no national funds set aside for historic preservation of buildings, of boats, of anything. There, it wasn't there. Um, he tried to get Wisconsin to help fund it. He tried to get Michigan to help fund it. Um, he just, Frank Hoffman could not get any money. He had triple mortgaged his bar to get the thing off the bottom, figuring that everybody would step in to help once he had it up, and it didn't happen. So here it's sitting on the bottom where his museum was supposed to be. You can see its back is clearly broken. Um, he's up to his ears in debt, uh, actually tries to burn the boat to get rid of it so that he could write off the debt. You know, and, uh, it was a real problem. The one thing that went well is that as the banks were coming for their money and hounding him, he called the curator at the Dawson Museum in Detroit figuring it was as far from Wisconsin as he could get right away. They went over with a truck, dead of night, loaded as much stuff as they could into the truck and brought it back to the Dawson. And soon after that, the boat simply collapsed. I mean, it just, it fell apart. Frank moved to Florida, died poor. They bulldozed the boat into a landfill, and that was it. And we thought most of the things from the Alvin Clark were gone until we talked to the former curator and said, John, what are, what are all these boxes sitting around here? And he said, that's what's left of the Alvin Clark. And it really is. So it's in our collection as well as taken care of as we can possibly keep it. Um, but it changed the laws. Ever after that, um, that's when the, the bottom lands law were, laws were passed uh, in the Reagan administration. Um, anything on the bottom stays on the bottom. That's the idea. And it was a big change for divers because divers so often went diving so they could bring up a cool piece of crockery or the ship's wheel or a bell or something. That was the reason they went diving was to not only find these things but get something cool to put on their mantle. Um, as we've understood the scholarship more, we know that as soon as you remove that piece of crockery, you've changed the story. So that if an archaeologist goes down, a historian goes down to try to understand what happened when this boat hit the bottom. And, and the boats are, are, they tell a story. If a boat hit the bottom a certain way, all the masts fell over the same direction. You can tell from the way the masts fell maybe how the boat hit. Or based on how things shifted, you can get a story of what happened in the last few seconds of that vessel's life based on looking at this stuff. You pull stuff up, you change the story. So the laws have changed, and the diving community really kind of embraced this. So now they go down. Most divers go down with cameras. That's why they go down. And they're finding new wrecks all the time, especially with the technology getting better. Uh, the changes in the lake level have shifted a lot of silt, and we're finding a lot of things. Michigan, I'm happy to say, leads the way in preserving shipwrecks. We've got 13. I think we're actually up to 15. I've got to adapt this slide. 15 preserves around the lakes in different spots, mostly where ships ran into rocks um, or were driven ashore by winds. Uh, but these preserves are essentially set aside as parks, underwater parks for divers. And they, oh, and I, shoot, I took the slide out. They go down and put uh, buoys on these wrecks 
so that, A, you're not tossing your anchor over when you go diving, because you're likely <laughs> to hit something when you do, but they also give you brochures. What can you expect if you go out to this wreck? How deep is it? Um, what angles it at? Uh, what hazards you're likely to encounter? Do you not want to go into that hatch because there's all kinds of chain or something you're likely to get caught in? Um, all of these wrecks have been documented and are available for wreck divers to go out to. Um, we were discussing beforehand, wreck diving isn't as popular as it was in the 1970s, 1980s, even the 1990s. Um, I don't think we're doing as many things outdoors as we should be, and I think diving is one of them. Um, because they are finding more wrecks, they're better preserved, they're set aside in areas where you can go out and enjoy them. Um, I did note one down there, that green one, Ohio was going to put one in, but they, they repealed the law at the last second. That doesn't exist. Wisconsin's just about to enact their first preserve. So Michigan with 15, we're way ahead of the game. We're also educating better. Uh, we talk about it down at the Dawson, but there are groups like the, the guys in the Pride of Michigan. This boat sails out of Mount Clemens. Um, they're sea cadets. They're tied in with the U.S. Navy program. These guys are taught not only to dive, but they're taught how to run the boat. Once that boat's away from the dock, the adult skippers step away, and the, the crew, the younger crew, takes over and runs the vessel. Uh, they learn about bathometry. They learn about limnology. They learn the, the science of the lakes. These guys have found some really cool stuff in association with Woods Hole and Michigan State University and Cranbrook Institute of Science. Um, they've gone down and found waterfalls down in the, in the Mackinac Strait that go back to the Ice Ages when the water flowed differently. They've gone down and searched the caves off of this waterfall looking for evidence of human remains. They've found elk runs in Lake Huron. They've found anaerobic sinkholes up near Alpena. Um, these guys have been involved in some really serious science and they're teenagers some of the best behaved teenagers you're ever going to find. It's a wonderful program. There's several Sea Scout programs throughout the Great Lakes that do a, a, a wonderful job of this. This one uh, seems to be at the top of the, that heap. But, you know, when they're not chasing down anaerobic sinkholes, they go out and they look at shipwrecks because that's what divers do. And, of course, up in Alpena, that, that Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary is the only one of federal. All of the other sanctuaries are run by local volunteers. The, the Michigan Underwater Preserves Council takes care of that. So this is, this is the only federal one, and the rest all are supported locally here. Um, we like to think we do that too at the Dawson Great Lakes Museum. It's, uh, this site has had a museum on it since 1949. It was one of the very first museums to teach Great Lakes history. It's the first building built specifically just to teach Great Lakes history. And we've been doing this building since 1960. These are the cannons off of one of the ships in the Battle of Lake Erie. We haven't, we're not exactly sure which ones, but we, we think we have an idea. Um, of course, if you've been there, how many have been to the Dawson Great Lakes Museum? That's, God, that's good to see here. I'm glad to hear that. Um, beautiful interior, the Gothic Room, um, you know, which was uh, the men's smoking lounge off of one of those beautiful old steamships. It's the only surviving example of Great Lakes steamboat architecture, steamboat Gothic. Um, you know, and this is the beautifully preserved. We've also got the pilot house from the William Clay Ford, which went out into that storm to look for the, the Fitzgerald. And after the Fitzgerald went down, we realized that there was an anchor sitting on the bottom of the Detroit River. We recovered it. We used that kind of as a memorial not only to the guys on the Fitz, but on the, to, to all the thousands. If there are 3,000 shipwrecks, there are 30,000 sailors. We can start at that number as far as how many people have been lost on the lakes. Um, and we've got you know, some recreational history there with uh, Miss Pepsi, too. Um, so what's that? Where is the Dawson? Well, I'm glad you asked that, sir. <laughs> the Dawson Great Lakes Museum is on Belle Isle. Um, it, it's uh, been there for years, but now is with uh, the island uh, being taken over by the State Park Service. Um, attendance has gone through the roof. Uh, when I started, we'd get 20 or 30 people on a Saturday. Um, we completely redid the museum about a year and a half ago, and when we reopened, we were getting 200 people on a Saturday. And then when the city took or the, the state took over the island, um, I believe the end of February or March, by April, we were getting 400 people on a Saturday. So. It's only right now open on Saturday and Sunday or Friday, Saturday, Sunday during the summer. 
we're hoping within the year, um, it's, it's got a wonderful collection of artifacts and uh, ephemera. It's got a tremendous archive. Uh, we've just applied for a grant that we hope to get so that we can get it back into a shape so it's as searchable as anything in this library and it's a, it's a wonderful nautical resource. So we're hoping to have it open at least Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Uh, the best part is it's free. Um, can I say that again? Yeah, I gotta say that again. Uh, best part is both our museums are free. They both got completely redone and uh, we are really proud of what we've been able to do over the last couple of years. So that's, that's what I've got and now I'm happy to keep answering questions. No, no, the Dawson is still run by the Detroit Historical Society, kind of like the aquarium is being run by that 501c3. The Dawson and the Detroit Historical Museum are both run by the Detroit Historical Society. Even though the city still owns the assets, we manage them. Um, no, it's free because we figured out it was a better way to get people in the door, um, more people in the door. You know, if a dad with a minivan and 10 kids drove up, and realized it was going to cost them 40 bucks to go in, he headed down to the free nature museum <laughs> zoo that was down the way. Um, whereas he comes in, they have a great time, the museum's full, um, he probably spends 10 bucks on candy at the front, at the gift shop, and then because he's feeling so good, he drops 20 bucks in the donation box on the way out. So we got 20 of the 30 bucks, they had a great time and our museum was full. We did it for three years at the Dawson. It worked, so when we reopened the main Detroit Historical Museum two years ago, we transferred the policy. So far, it's holding. Um, it's not producing quite as much revenue as if we had it, but with the rise in the number of people who are there, that works real well in our favor. And it, it's wonderful to see a change